there is a huge debate, of course, between peace and justice. You know, and this is not a new debate. Um, most of the time, ICC is being uh, told that you should not have intervened when you did, or you should wait, or you should never intervene, or you should sequence. And I think um, the more and more we realize that we should find a way of making uh, peace and justice work together, because it's possible that it, it, they can work together. Peace and justice, instead of delaying justice you know, in the interest of peace, because at the end of the day, you do not have either of them. You don't have peace and you don't have justice. So since uh, they are not mutually exclusive, you know, we should look for, for ways um, to, to also address that problem of peace and justice. I am going to, um, I think um, I've been talking for some time, and we don't have the luxury of too, too much time on our hands. So I'm going to um, invite uh, High Excellency Mary to intervene and uh, say a few words. Okay. okay. Right. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, could I say that this is my first time appearing at this uh, Creative Leadership uh, Summit, the Bloom Creative Leadership Summit. And I wanted to talk about uh, the issues that we've been asked to talk about governance security from that creative leadership perspective. I'd like to build on what Fatou has already said. In fact, the elders that I'm a member of, brought together by Nelson Mandela, we had an opportunity in May mm -hmm. of formally visiting the International Criminal Court deliberately yeah. to say this is an incredibly important institution mm -hmm. for the two reasons that have been emphasized. One, uh, increasingly, those who are alleged to have committed very serious crimes can now be brought before an international court. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the impact on rule of law and standards of criminal justice um, in the um, members of the International Criminal Court. I thought I might just touch on three initiatives in the area of rule of law which don't involve government, because Jane, I think, is going to focus more on the role of government, which, of course, is very central. But just to show uh, that rule of law and adherence to uh, principles of justice and uh, support for the international human rights system are regarded by very, very many in civil society, including business people, as being absolutely vital mm -hmm. um, for very valid reason. Um, I have participated from the beginning in the World Justice Project, uh, which was in fact the brainchild of Bill Newcomb um, in his time as president of the American Bar Association. Mm -hmm. And he reached out not just to bar associations around the world, but to other professional bodies, engineers, mm -hmm. nurses, um, other professional groups, and foundations and NGOs, and we've been meeting um, uh, in, in different parts of the world mm -hmm. um, and developing a rule of law index, which I think now covers about 80 countries, and which uh, assesses um, the, um, under, under a number of different uh, relevant criteria, the progress or lack of progress in uh, rule of law. Um, Prior to being involved in the World Justice Project, around about the same time, I also was participating on a commission on legal empowerment of the poor. Mm -hmm. um, and what was fascinating about that commission, uh, supported um, working out of the UN, uh, supported by UNDP, supported also by a number of governments, notably uh, Scandinavian uh, governments, was that in essence about four billion people in our world today do not have the benefit of access to justice and the rule of law. Mm -hmm. They live in the informal sector, they rely on neighbors and money lenders, um, they don't have insurance against crisis, and it's somehow a disconnect in our world that that is the case. So we came out with a number of different recommendations, including uh, recommendations um, for greatly enhancing access to justice, the role of paralegals, the role of legal resource centers, mm -hmm. the role of women lawyers groups in many countries now, the, the, the way in which uh, there can be a, a greater outreach and greater um, access uh, to justice. A third initiative uh, focuses on governance on the continent of Africa, and it was started by a businessman, Mo Ibrahim. I'm, I serve on his board and also on the prize committee. Mo Ibrahim, uh, as a number of you will know, founded Celtel International and uh, made um, a considerable fortune installing cells, uh, cell phone systems in African countries, mm -hmm. and he did it without um, corruption. 
Um, he had an, an international board of great prestige, and no decision worth more than, I think it was about $30,000, could be taken without the board itself being party to the decision. So it just cut out um, the uh, corruption that was um, often implicit in, in, in uh, doing business in that way. And um, having made a great deal of money and um, sold out to the Kuwaiti, Ku Kuwaitis, he, he decided to have a foundation that would uh, focus on governance and rule of law in African countries, because his experience as a businessman was, this was what was holding African countries back, um, the lack of uh, good governance. So we have established the Ibrahim Index, um, and uh, if you go into the website of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, moibrahimfoundation.org, um, you can really um, see um, a very uh, you know, user-friendly index mm -hmm. that tells you how countries are doing. Uh, I have a great interest in two countries, um, and uh, they're very close to Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia. I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in recent years in both. They are coming up as post-conflict poor countries. They're actually coming up rather steadily mm -hmm. in the index. But what was most interesting, I think, in recent years, because the index started with the countries of sub-Saharan Africa, um, and there were um, we look at human development, we look at um, um, rule of law and, and um, participation, human rights, we look at um, uh, human security, um, social welfare, ta poverty, etc. And uh, we now cover and have for the last few years covered uh, the 53 or now 54 with South Sudan uh, countries of um, Africa. And uh, when the... Um, uh, movements of people um, that you've been talking about this morning. The Arab Spring began in Tunisia and then Egypt mm -hmm. and Libya. It was pointed out that those countries figured relatively highly on the Mo Ibrahim Index, and how was that? Oh. Um, and it's true that they did figure relatively highly, except that when you probed more deeply, they figured highly on the um, development um, um, criteria, mm -hmm. but poorly on uh, rule of law, justice, participation, and human rights. And um, we could see that a gap had opened up between how they were doing on economic development and how they were doing on justice, participation, and human rights. It's almost as if this, this index, you can now predict the countries mm -hmm. that are uh, vulnerable from that point of view. So I think what uh, I find interesting is how, um, how important it is um, to uh, doing business, to creating jobs, to um, having um, a system of um, security, uh, to, um, uh, to, to reinforce tackling corruption, establishing independence of judges and rule of law. Mm. Um, at a press conference uh, launching uh, the, I think it was the fourth um, uh, Ibrahim Index, in Johannesburg, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, a journalist asked Mo Ibrahim, he said, well, as a former businessman and somebody who knows the business world very well, um, which um, of the uh, various um, uh, sectors would you look to um, as a businessman to decide whether you'd invest in a country? And he said, without uh, hesitation, rule of law mm -hmm. and respect for uh, human rights. So that, that would be uh, where he would look to. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I was going to say was, um, last year, I had the um, honor to participate in a civil society advisory uh, group uh, to advise the United Nations in preparing for the 10th anniversary of an important Security Council resolution, um, a Security Council re resolution on women, peace, and security, um, which was focused on the fact that 10 years after that um, resolution had been adopted by the Security Council, it was not being implemented. Women were not at the table mm -hmm. in um, conflict situations. Mm -hmm. Women were not appointed sufficiently or at all as mediators, mm -hmm. not sufficiently as special representatives of the Secretary General mm -hmm. um, in countries, uh, post-conflict countries, though I must say Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has now made a, 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 a much more appointments, but it's still the number is quite low. And uh, grassroots women and the civil society advisory group that we co-chaired, I co-chaired with Binti Diop, who heads a very good organization in Africa called Fam Africa Solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, we were saying that women have to be consulted, women have to be at the table. Yeah. I was recently with the elders in Cote d'Ivoire, 
just after the end of the violence yeah. there, um, and um, I met with women's groups, mm -hmm. and they were very angry yeah. because they said, actually, despite the 10th anniversary, despite all the recommendations, yeah. they had not been involved, they had not been at the table, they had not had a role to play. Yeah. So um, I just want to throw out these ideas more than um, give a lecture because we don't have mm -hmm. time if we're going to hear um, from the floor. Yeah. But um, the importance of rule of law for yeah. countries um, the importance of the recognition of that mm -hmm. by um, a, a much wider community, the mm -hmm. business community, um, the professional bodies, not just lawyers, but other professional groups, mm -hmm. the importance for women, of women, peace and security, the important institution created um, in, uh, uh, while I was serving as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, I described it as the most important new institution of the 20th century, yeah. um, and it's now the 21st century, 21st century. and it's a, yeah. it's a young institution in yeah. that. But these are, I think, um, the, uh, the ideas about rule of law, which take it out of mm -hmm. uh, being in a cul-de-sac and make it more um, part of yeah. um, the uh, doing, uh, the importance of, of, of human security yeah. in our world today. Thank you. Um, so it's only natural that you should now hear from the Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> um, I think it's a testament to the, um, the, the vision of this gathering and of Louise Bluen and the Bluen Foundation mm -hmm. and the Creative Leadership Summit. Um, but A, in this conversation of security, law, justice, war, and conflict, you have three women mm -hmm. um, uh, on this panel. And that we come from as diverse backgrounds as, they do, as we do. Um, and though I am uh, serving in my government now as the Deputy Secretary of the third largest department, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, something probably many of you have heard of. Um, not everybody knows what it means to talk about Homeland Security. I'll touch on that briefly. Mm -hmm. But just to say, by way of my own background, I began my career as a soldier in the United States Army. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking and writing about how to fight wars, how they end, mm -hmm. uh, what factors combine to keep war from ending, and how war very often, in fact, always, is a manifestation of lawlessness, of the absence of the rule of law, whether there's no order or contested order or alternative order uh, in the offing. War is a reflection of that lawlessness. I then had the privilege of working very closely uh, with two whom I know this audience will know well, Cyrus Vance, the former US Secretary of State, David Hamburg, the former head of Carnegie Corporation of New York, uh, Mary was associated with this work in, at, at many points along the way, as were a number of other distinguished international civil servants, on the question of how do we prevent mm -hmm. war from occurring? How do we prevent mass violence? How do we prevent this assault on the rule of law? We act too often as human beings as if war is the weather, that it just happens. Uh, but war is not the weather. Uh, war is a choice. It involves human agency. Um, and similarly, asserting and preserving and honoring the rule of law requires human agency as well. What's the role of government in all of this? Um, does government occupy all the space, take up all the oxygen when it comes to the rule of law? Indeed, when we talk about the rule of law, whether in post-conflict societies or in highly developed societies, what we like to think of them anyway, mm -hmm. what's involved? Fundamentally, there are several things. It's a corpus of laws that have been legitimately derived, widely promulgated, and understood, accepted mm -hmm. by the population over whom they govern. There's a wonderful line in an American uh, Supreme Court case, the Youngstown Steel Seizure case, for those of you who know it, that says, ours is a, is a, is a nation of laws, not of men. We submit to no rulers except under rules. That is ultimately what the rule of law is all about. So it's a corpus of laws, it's institutions, as we've talked about, that are non-corrupt, that are accountable and answerable. Um, th there are transitional mechanisms that we've seen. Uh, there are independent judiciaries, prosecutors, uh, and these systems, and a legitimate penal system that does some good. All of these are institutions that preserve the rule of law, as is regular, transparent rulemaking, binding adjudication, and again, this ever important issue of accountability. So I know we'll talk uh, to the audience, give you an opportunity to engage. Mm -hmm. But governments ultimately, we ask them to do three things for us as citizens. Provide us with security, the foundation for security, the foundation for well-being, and the foundation for justice. In Homeland Security, our job is trying, help trying to create a safe, secure, resilient place where the American way of life can thrive. But we know fundamentally that the government can't do all that needs doing in this space, and that indeed, 
they're a role not only for states and for cities, but for the people themselves to engage with us as the government institutions in transparent ways because powerfully the people today have norms and expectations of transparency. They have norms and expectations of inclusivity, mm -hmm. accountability, and reciprocity. And then for us, the, the burden, the challenge, the privilege, really, is to maintain that in a way that gains and maintains the trust of the American people. And so I, I, I just wanted to offer those few remarks by way of reflection on this subject to know that we certainly believe that governments can't do all that needs doing in this space. Thank yeah. you. Thank you both. And I'm, I'm going to soon invite uh, uh, um, comments from the, from the floor. But before I do that, I think there are two, 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 two issues that I wanted to mention in the Rome Statute, which I think are crucial for both security as well as for uh, 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 security and the rule of law, um, is, the, is the principle of complementarity and victim participation. Uh, with respect to complementarity, it is uh, showing that either the state where the, where the um, crimes occur will take it, or the ICC will take it, if you are a member of the ICC. Um, so which means that the option of uh, lack of accountability is no longer there. You know, if those crimes are committed in your, uh, in a member state's, uh, um, a, a state that has signed and ratified, if those crimes happen and you do not do it, either you are unable or you are unwilling to do it, the ICC will step in and take it. And the other one is vict um, the participation of victims. Also for the first time at the international level, uh, victims can actually participate in the proceedings. And this is not a privilege, it is a right that they have under the statute. And we see that uh, in all the situations that we are currently handling, victims are playing a big role. You know, they are asking to participate, their views and concerns are taken into, into account at the proceedings. And at the end of it all, they can ask for reparation, which I think is also very... And there's a fund. Yeah. yeah. And there is also the trust fund for victims, which was created together with the ICC. And the trust fund is mainly just dealing with issues of victim, you know, reparations for victims. And uh, it has not yet uh, done a formal proceeding, but I think with the end of the first case of the ICC, which uh, perhaps we'll, we will have before the end of this year, I think they will, they will have a formal proceedings of uh, seeing how those who are affected in this conflict-torn societies can at least be giving some form of reparation. I will now... Uh, invite comments or questions from the floor. Yes. Oh, OK. It's cool. Lynn Wells from National Defense University. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the question, my question concerns the role of technology and rule of law. Um, we uh, were involved in a study with the World Justice Forum about a year ago on alternative dispute resolution uh, of use of things like cell phones in oral societies to actually put together sort of uh, community courts or whatever to be able to hear uh, uh, issues among distributed um, plaintiffs. I'm just wondering, is this something that's active and that you're actively pursuing? I was quite surprised when we teed this up, sort of thing laughed out of the office. We got people from Sri Lanka and London and Tokyo. Apparently, there's a very wide movement. I'm just not sure where you are, where it fits in your, uh, your mm. framework. Mm. Thank you. Um, I'll take, you want, you you want to take maybe? a couple more? Or? I'll take two more questions yeah. and then uh, the panelists will end. Thank you. I, had one, I wanted you to talk about this, the current status of responsibility to protect uh, with, in light of Libya. Uh, the second was, I'd like to hear what, if there's any movement for the United States uh, to move for ratification of the ICC in, in my country, because we helped create it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the third is global governance and rule of law, uh, increasing the jurisdictional capacity of the International Court of Justice in particular, which, you know, which is so, so weak, mm -hmm. and thus the Security Council really doesn't have any judicial oversight. And I wondered if you could address mm -hmm. this sort of inter interrelated questions. Okay. One more question? Oh. 
Oh, okay. <coughs> excuse me, John Allen, Greater China Corporation. And this is for Mary Robinson. You mentioned Mo Ibrahim. Could you tell us about, and this morning earlier, we learned that incentives and contests uh, incentivize doing good. Now, Mo Ibrahim has a foundation to incentivize good governance for rulers in Africa when they graduate and leave office. And I wonder if uh, Barry Robinson could tell us about that. And since you are also involved with Liberia and Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. is Ellen Johnson Sirleaf a candidate <laughs> for that award? <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe I'd take the question on technology and that last question, since it was specifically, I think they were both specifically for me. And then, um, I, I do believe that technology can play a very constructive role, and I'm all in favor. I think one of the most effective, and it's quite a while ago, uh, uses of technology uh, to address issues of justice was the Witness mm -hmm. initiative that Peter Gabriel and, and the organization Witness uh, were involved in, which was to put... Um, cameras and recorders into the hands of those who were in situations of conflict to enable them to provide the first-hand accounts. Now, we're seeing, and I'm sure this came up in your discussion of the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. um, the incredible importance of the iPhone, etc. We wouldn't know what was going on in Syria mm -hmm. um, if it wasn't for the brave uh, protesters who go out in the street uh, to face live ammunition being a shot at them, but also hold the cameras so the world can see. Mm -hmm. And so I think in so many different ways now, um, uh, you know, we, we need to build in um, the, uh, the, the use of technology in a, in a, in a, in a positive um, sense. Uh, of course, we also know that the cell phone can have the negative impact that uh, you can trace people through their cell phones. So it's, it's not all positive. There's also the downside of that. Um, uh, I mentioned when I uh, referenced the Mo Ibrahim Foundation as being about uh, leadership and governance in African countries, that there is the Mo Ibrahim Index, but you're quite right, the other side of it, and that the side of it that got m most of the publicity initially mm -hmm. was that Mo decided to incentivize the idea of um, uh, um, giving exceptional leadership mm -hmm. and then not trying to change the constitution and remain on um, in um, positions of power. Why did he do that? I think he did it because he saw as an African that um, to, be, to become president of a country mm -hmm. was a position of enormous power mm -hmm. and influence over the country, but also over the assets of the country. Yeah. And um, there was no equivalent future for post-presidents in Africa to the future of those of us who are um, exalted has-beens like myself, former presidents. We can have all kinds of options of professorships or giving uh, paid lectures or being involved in foundations or whatever. Um, that wasn't um, uh, the, the, the situation. So you had great power mm -hmm. while you were in office, great dependency of large numbers of people um, who would be your future dependents one way or another in the African way, yeah. and no income to support that. So of course, far too many presidents tried to change the constitution. So that was at least part of the thinking behind the foundation. And I think we were very fortunate in the first two years to have exceptional leaders that we could award. Mm -hmm. um, president Chisano of Mozambique, the former president of Mozambique, um, who uh, not only um, led his country well, but recognized the role of opposition mm -hmm. in governance and uh, you know, was particularly thoughtful about creating space for opposition to, to, to work well. And then Festus Machai of Botswana, um, he came into um, an African country that's, rel that's well governed by, you know, by the broad standards, but he also prioritized addressing HIV and AIDS um, with a particular leadership quality because it was the one issue in his country that was um, uh, having a, a devastating impact. And uh, we've always said it was exceptional. I hope we will have in the future um, other leaders. But what I think has happened now is this has prompted the idea of former leaders in African countries mm -hmm. um, being states, men and hopefully women. And there are now um, others um, uh, who are forming these kind of leadership groups, which are very important. Um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is not eligible at the moment for the Mo Ibrahim Prize because she's busy fighting an election. Mm. I hope she will be re-elected and I... Um, think it will be great for her country if she is, if she serves another term and 
does well, she will then be eligible for consideration, um, but uh, not yet. Okay. Yeah. I'll only say one thing about the technology question because it's so interesting and we face it every day. Um, one, of, one of the things we spend a lot of time on is cybersecurity. What's the challenge in cybersecurity? It's easy, protect your identity, protect your information. I mean, the rest, as they say, is commentary. Um, how do we do that? Technology is way out here. I mean, technology is, was the word that we use to describe tools that came within our grasp. Now it precisely means those things that are beyond our understanding. I mean, we don't only leave it to the experts, we're leaving it to the next generation to figure out what technology can do and the problems that it will present and the solutions it will offer. Trailing technology is our social sensibility. We've made tremendous progress as a, as a species, the human race. We still have a long way to go. And, and when we talk about the social technological interface, it is, shall we say, imperfect. Trailing all of this, of course, is the law. <laughs> now, at some level, the law has always been a lagging indicator. Um, but we really can't afford for that to be any longer the case when technology is so outpacing mm. our ability to cope. Um, I uh, just to um, say one final word, and I think it has to do with your question about um, the position of the U.S. joining the ICC. Yes, I. Um, I will, I will leave that to my State Department <laughs> we, colleagues. As an uh, official of the, uh, yeah, as an official of the court, also we we do not um, uh, comment on governments and states who join or don't want to join because ICC, as you know, is a voluntary organization. It's a, um, states voluntarily enter, sign the treaty, and ratify and become members of the ICC. I think doing that is sending a signal that impunity is no longer an option. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for much. being here. And thank you to our two panelists. Yeah.